Hi, welcome to my channel. Today's video is a continuation of one of my earlier videos on cyclotron. So in my previous video, when I discussed a cyclotron, I talked about the principle and working mechanism of a cyclotron, which is basically a kind of a particle accelerator that can accelerate charged particles to very, very high velocities. However, one limitation of cyclotron is that cyclotrons do not operate when charged particles reach relativistic speeds. So when charged particle reaches relativistic speeds, the cyclotron is unable to accelerate those particles further. So this is where a synchrotron comes into the picture. A synchrotron, you may say, is a modification of a cyclotron such that it can also accelerate charged particles beyond relativistic speeds. So to understand the working mechanism and principle of a synchrotron, let's take a few moments to revise the working mechanism of a cyclotron so that we can understand how the cyclotron works and why it stops working at relativistic speeds and then how synchrotron comes to the rescue. So a cyclotron is basically this kind of a, a cylinder which is cut in half and one half of the cylinder is named as D1, the other half is named as D2 and this is placed perpendicular to some magnetic field and inside these two half cylinders there is a charged particle which is moving. Now if a charged particle is moving in some kind of a plane and this charged particle experiences magnetic field perpendicular to the plane, what happens? The charged particle executes circular motion. So if a charged particle is moving in a plane, it experiences magnetic field perpendicular to the plane, it experiences circular motion. And this is what happens. If there is a charged particle here, in the top view, the charged particle experiences circular motion. So the cyclotron takes advantage of the circular motion of a particle in the presence of a perpendicular magnetic field to make the particle revolve in circular revolutions over and over again in a small region. Now, that itself is not enough because even though a charged particle is moving in a circular revolution, that only changes the velocity direction. It does not change the magnitude of the velocity. So what else happens inside the cyclotron to increase the velocity of the charged particle? So to understand this, we have this particular setup. So these two half cylinders D1 and D2 are connected to an oscillating potential. So there is some kind of a potential difference between one half and the other half of the cylinder. So there is some kind of a potential difference between D1 and D2. Now this oscillating potential is like some kind of an AC voltage. All right. So at some point in time, D1 will be positive and D2 will be negative. In some other point in time, D1 will be negative and D2 will be positive. And based on that, there is going to be some kind of electric field either uh, from D2 to D1 or from D1 to D2. Now, how does that help in accelerating the charged particle? So let's suppose that initially the charged particle is going along in this kind of a semicircular trajectory. The moment it comes out of D1 and it is about to penetrate D2, let's suppose at that moment D1 is at positive potential and D2 is at negative potential. So what is going to happen? If this is positive and this is negative, the electric field is going to be in this direction. So if the electric field is in this direction, the particle will experience an acceleration in this particular direction. So as it experiences acceleration, it enters D2 with a greater velocity than with what it exited from D1. Now we can all understand the mathematics by looking at these equations that I've written here. So the Lorentz force law provides a centripetal acceleration. From here I can calculate the velocity. As you can see velocity and radii of the circular revolution are proportional to each other and this is the time period of revolution which is basically a constant. It is only dependent on magnetic field and other constants. So basically the velocity, if I increase the velocity, the radius of revolution of the charged particle will also increase. So now as the particle experiences an acceleration, its velocity increases. So now the radii of revolution also increases. So this is why you see the radii increasing over a many number of revolutions. It is not just one circle, it is like a spiral, the particle is spiraling out. Why? Because at each step the velocity is increasing. Now. Again, as the particle enters D2, let's suppose the oscillating potential reverses its direction. That means now D2 is positive and D1 is negative. So now if the charged particle comes and is about to 
is exiting D2, now it experiences an electric field in the positive direction. So now again it experiences a positive acceleration and then it enters D1. And when it enters D1, let's suppose oscillating potential reverses the direction. So D1 becomes positive, D2 becomes negative. So as it exits, it again experiences acceleration. So again it enters D2, oscillating potential reverses direction. So again it experiences acceleration here. So every time the particle is going from D1 to D2, it experiences positive acceleration downwards. And every time the particle is going from D2 to D1, it experiences is positive acceleration upwards. This is how every time the particle is in this gap, it always experiences some sort of an acceleration and its velocity increases. Now, because with increase in velocity, the radii also increases. So you see this sort of a spiraling outward kind of motion as the velocity keeps on increasing. However, the time period of revolution is a constant. It depends upon magnetic field, charge and the mass of the particle. That means the frequency of revolution of the charged particle is a constant. So even though the radii of the charged particle is increasing and the velocity of the charged particle is increasing at each step, the frequency of revolution is constant. It depends only on the magnetic field, mass and the charge of the charged particle. Now this is very important. Why? Because we need to synchronize this setup in such a manner that the potential reverses only when the charged particle has gone from one D to the other D. So this sort of a charged particle completing half a revolution and the potential changing its polarities must be synchronized. That means the oscillating potential also must have a frequency which is exactly equal to the frequency of revolution of the charged particle. Only then both the charged particles motion and the oscillating potential potentials wave will be in phase and every time the charged particle is in the gap it will experience a positive acceleration. We can understand that by looking at this particular diagram. So this particular diagram this white line represents the oscillating potential let's suppose. So it is the oscillating potential for D1. Okay, so initially D1 is positive, then D1 is negative, then D1 is positive, and then D1 becomes negative, then D1 is positive, and D1 becomes negative, and so on and so on. Right. And this dotted line, this dashed pink line represents the revolution of the charged particle. So the charged particle, so for uh, uh, this particular oscillation, the charged particle creates one revolution. For this particular oscillation, the charged particle creates another revolution and on and on. So let's understand what is happening. So let's suppose the charged particle is initially at D1. So the dashed line, when it is going from top to bottom, it is basically the charged particle is basically going from D1 to D2. And when the charged particle is going from D2 to D1, the dashed line is going upwards. So if you understand this, then everything is going to be uh, become very, very easy. So, so if you see the dashed line, the moment this dashed line reaches here, all right. So this is the point where the charged particle exits D1 and enters this region. Then it basically experiences what? It experiences a potential in D1 which is positive. You see this? This point is basically representing a pot positive potential for D1. That means if D1 is positive and D2 is negative, that means it experiences positive acceleration. Yes. So the charged particle gets accelerated. It enters D2 and now again. It is about to exit from D2. So if it is about to exit from D2, this represents what? This represents a negative potential for D1. So if D1 is a negative potential, that means D2 is a positive potential. So the acceleration, uh, the electric field is in this direction and acceleration is also in this direction. So as you can see here at each step. So again, in the next time when it is about to exit D1 and go to D2, it experiences a positive acceleration. And as it goes, as it exits D2, again here it experiences a positive acceleration because D1 is negative and D2 is positive and on and on and on. So at each step, because both of these two waves are in phase, you see the revolution of the charged particle and the uh, frequency of the AC voltage are in phase because of this every time the particle exits D1 and goes to D2 it experiences a positive acceleration and every time the particle goes from D2 to D1 again it experiences a positive acceleration thereby the velocity of the charged particle increasing at each step and reaching very very high velocities. This is the uh, effectively the working mechanism of a cyclotron but where does the problem arise? The problem arises here you see this Initially, I told you, we can calculate the frequency of revolution and that is a constant. It depends upon mass, magnetic field, charge 
of the particle. Now when the velocity of the charged particle becomes very very high and it reaches a relativistic speeds then a relativistic increase in mass comes into the picture. Earlier mass was a constant and therefore frequency was a constant and all we had to do was keep the oscillating frequency and the frequency of revolution of the charged particle to be equal so that both these two are in phase and the charged particle will only experience acceleration every time. But now in the case of relativistic velocities when the particle approaches very very high velocities the mass starts to increase when the mass starts to increase then the frequency will start to decrease there is a relativistic decrease in the frequency of the revolution of the charged particle so now what is going to happen is that initially the frequency of the charged particle was constant but once relativistic velocities come into the picture the frequency of revolution starts decreasing so now the frequency of revolution of the charged particle and the frequency of the oscillating potential will go out of phase and because of this what is going to happen is that now the charged particle initially was accelerating at each point in the gap now that is not going to happen in some cases it will experience acceleration in other cases it will experience deceleration thereby canceling both these effects and we will reach a limit beyond which the charged particle cannot be accelerated so let's look at again so as the charged particle is going from d1 to d2 it experiences a positive a positive acceleration because d1 is positive d2 is negative but again next time it also experiences a positive acceleration because d2 is positive and d1 is negative but now look here as the charged particle reaches here and it goes here basically it is going from where it is going from d1 to d2 yes so it is going from d1 to d2 here but d1 is what d1 is negative that means d2 is positive so the particle is going in this direction but the electric field is in the opposite direction so at this point it will experience a retardation or deceleration in velocity again as it reaches here what is it is basically going from d2 to d1 but d1 is at positive potential and d1 is a positive potential that means d2 is a negative potential that means the electric field is in this direction so the particle as it goes in this direction will experience deceleration same thing is going to happen uh, here it will experience deceleration here it will experience deceleration so for certain time periods it will experience acceleration for certain time periods it will experience deceleration that means effectively this system is no more efficient in increasing the velocity of the charged particle anymore this is the point where a cyclotron fails this is a point where a synchrotron comes into the picture so how does a synchrotron uh, overcome this problem it overcomes this problem by basically changing either the frequency or the magnetic field in the case of a cyclotron frequency of revolution frequency of oscillating potential and magnetic field were constant all right such that frequency of revolution and frequency of oscillating potential were same but now in the case of the synchrotron what we can do is either we can change the frequency of the oscillating potential or we can change the magnetic field such that both these two uh, 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 waves are in phase that means as the particle is revolving and slowly its frequency starts decreasing we also decrease the frequency of the oscillating potential or we decrease the magnetic field so either by varying the oscillating potential or by varying the magnetic field we make sure that this new oscillating potential or new frequency is in phase with the motion of the charged particle as the motion of the charged particle reaches relativistic speeds so let's revise in the case of a cyclotron the oscillating potential and the frequency of revolution were in phase at relativistic speeds the oscillating potential had a constant frequency but the frequency of revolution started slowing down and went out of phase thereby cancelling any effects of acceleration but in the case of a synchrotron this uh, uh, dotted line represents the uh, change in the frequency of the uh, charged particles revolution so with the change in the frequency of the charged particles revolution as the velocity increases we also change the frequency of either the oscillating potential or the magnetic field in a similar fashion so that they both remain in phase so if you look here as a charged particle is going uh, from d1 to d2 it experiences positive acceleration as a charged particle is going from d2 to d1 so d1 is a negative d2 is a positive it experiences positive acceleration as a charged particle is again going from d1 to d2 it experiences positive acceleration again 
positive acceleration again positive acceleration and again positive acceleration so now by changing the phase of either the oscillating potential or the value of the magnetic field we make sure that the frequency of revolution and the frequency of the oscillating potential are in phase thereby accelerating the charged particles even further than relativistic speeds so where the cyclotron fails at relativistic speeds synchrotron can take over thereby accelerating the charged particles to even greater velocities thus reaching very very high energies for that kind of a charged particle so that now that kind of a charged particle can be used to bombard to some kind of a target nucleus to perform some sort of a nuclear experiment so this is the general idea of a cyclotron and a synchrotron a cyclotron fails at relativistic speeds but a synchrotron takes over by modulating either the oscillating potential or the magnetic field to keep both these two waves in phase that's it for today thank you very much